Well, good morning, everybody, and especially to you folks that are watching from home. I want to let you know that now would be a good time for you to go pause this and print your notes that Jimmy has sent you so that you'll have them when the lesson starts. Celesta? You needed to say something to us today, didn't you? I do. <laughs> okay, it's uh, toward the end of the month, and so I'm looking at the first Sunday of next month, uh, and on through December, this is our little list of those that would like to bring goodies um, for y'all to for us to have for our celebration Sunday, uh, where we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. So I need one more uh, person, couple, for July to help bring some stuff. So I'm going to start it and let y'all pass it around and uh, get it going. Okay? okay. All, right. All right. Thank you. Well, we had a good response and a good time on the first Sunday of this month, so let's uh, try to continue that process. Well, good morning again. We've got a couple of uh, visitors with us today. Holly, good to have you back. Have you joined us yet? No. You're, stu you're studying on it. That's okay. I just, nobody had told me, so I had to ask. Michael, you want to come up here? and uh, We've got Michael Martin. Yes. Eric. Eric. Why I got Michael, I have no idea. Uh, Sam and Paula, you've been in class, so you know all about the church now. So we, we can ask you questions later. Come on up, Eric. This is Eric Martin. We need to pray for him because Tommy's his father. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you for your time today. Uh, it's Father's Day, and if you'll allow me, I'd like to honor my dad, Tommy Martin. Yeah. Uh, Proverbs is my favorite book in the Bible. And Proverbs 20, verse 7 says, The righteous man walks with integrity, even his children will be blessed. I've had a very blessed life. Uh, I have three children, possibly working on number four. I got two grandchildren and two on the way. And uh, I live with the man that I never saw take a drink, I never saw smoke a cigarette, and I never heard a cuss word come out of his mouth. He taught me to get up and go to work every day and to kneel down and pray every night. And because of that, I have blessed life and blessed children. Thank you, Pops. Thank you. Would that our kids could all say that about us as fathers. Yeah. Uh, guys, I want to remind you that Romeo's is this coming Saturday, 8 o'clock at Bacon's. Uh, hold your hands up that plan to attend and let me get a count. Uh, <laughs> you're in trouble now. Ronnie, Richard, okay, Bob, Jimmy. Jimmy. Sam, okay, and uh, Ben, and I'm going to get a check uh, through the email and see if somebody will uh, respond to that. So uh, it gives me an idea. I appreciate it. We had a good time last time. We anticipate having a good time this coming event. Folks, mark your calendars for July the 9th. That's a Friday. We're going to have our first fellowship as a class since our chili cook-off in early of 2020. So I'll say the same thing that the uh, old boy did that did the uh, Wolf Brand chili commercial. Well, that's too long. <laughs> What's the date again, Harry? July the 9th. It'll be in Fellowship Hall, food, fun, and games for all. So again, that's July the 9th. We'll tell you a little bit more about it as that time approaches. Does anyone have anything they need to bring up. I've got a couple of announcements. First of all, uh, July Sunday, July 4th, we're going to have a patriotic service, in, uh, which is traditional for each year. The choir does a uh, special, so we're looking forward to that. Always do. And let me read this to you. It says, Need Volunteers. Our church hostess needs volunteers to help prep, cook, 
and serve food for various church events throughout the year. If you're willing to help, contact Gwen Boyd in the ministry gallery. And I'm sure that that's not a, like a permanent position where you're going to be responsible for it all the time. But you can get that information from Gwen if you're interested in the church gallery. Now let me tell you about, since it, it, it's appropriate, it's some father-daughter time. While mother is out shopping, the little girl decides that she's going to have a tea party. So she sets her little table and she makes tea and serves it to her father. Well, about that time, mother comes home from shopping and the husband said, watch this. And he turned to the little girl and said, I think mama would like some tea. So the little girl left and she brought back some tea and gave it to her mother. Her mother looked at the father and said, did it ever occur to you that the only place she can get water is from the toilet? <laughs> Jimmy Kaplan. <laughs> Tea time. What a tough act to follow. Well, good morning, folks. Happy Father's Day to you guys. Uh, thank you for that. That's that talk. It really, really blessed my heart. I, I wish my boys could say all that, but they probably can't say all that, do you? <laughs> Especially the smoking part. Okay, welcome to a Father's Day uh, lesson today. We're going to be in the book of Job, continuing. And those of you that are watching on video, be sure and get your hand out now and start to follow along. Uh, Let's look at a couple of signs I found today. When the rapture comes, who's going to change this sign? Will you? I hope your answer is no. <laughs> Here's a good one. Mosquitoes also know there's power in the blood. Now here's one. It, it, it's, it's kind of cute. Septic tanks pumped. Swimming pools filled. Not same truck. Here's one here. The wife says, what do you want for supper? Savory beef, mouth-watering salmon, or luscious chicken? He says, I believe I'll have the mouth-watering salmon. She says, I'm talking to the cat. <laughs> we, we all know how he feels, don't we? Here's, here's another good one. Whenever I get mad at you, you never seem to get upset. How do you manage to control your temper? I just go and clean the toilet. He says, how does that help? I use your toothbrush. <laughs> Always examine your toothbrush, fellow. Here's a good one. A friend who has worked in Chicago his entire life tells me it's not that violent. He's a tail gunner on a school bus. <laughs> <laughs> and a little Maxine, chocolate is a woman's reward for putting up with men. Yeah. Amen for that. Now, here's my serious one for the day. Smiles are contagious. Go forth and contaminate as many people as you can. Is that good? All right. <clears throat> Let me tell you, as you know, we're, we're in the book of Job, and so far this is our third week. Well, John taught chapter 1, Richard cha taught chapter 14, and I've got chapter 19. So as you can see, we're going through there very rapidly. And I think, as I was studying, I think, well, you know, chapter 19 is kind of a pivotal uh, uh, passage. And I think we need to really catch up to where we are. So I'm going to do some, a little bit longer review than we normally do today. But let me show you a verse that came to my mind as I started studying this week. Out of the book of Romans. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So even the book of Job, which sometimes we don't seem to understand real well. 
It was written for our learning. And you're going to see today, I think we're going to learn something today through this. Okay? Now, the book of Job is filled with nuggets. This is what we've got to look for. And that when applied to our life today, will give us understanding and assurance of God's provision during a time of suffering. John shared with us in the introduction that the book of Job is one of the first poetic or wisdom books in the Old Testament for, in the Christian Bible. Well, so that means that there's much wisdom in this book. Do you remember when we studied the book of Proverbs? We learned the difference between knowledge and wisdom. The word logos is the written word which is recording in the Bible. And when we, when we read the written word, we gain knowledge about God and his ways, his salvation, and his plan for mankind. Without the logos, we would have to no way to know God's purpose or our place for that purpose. Thank, thank God for giving us the Bible, which gives us the knowledge about who he is and what he does. But then we have the word rhema, which means the instant, personal speaking of God. God gave us his word, logos, to know about him and his purposes. God uses his word to speak to you personally, which is the rhema, so you can know him personally and know his love and provision and have assurance. Both logos and rhema are critical, crucial to our Christian life. God uses his logos word to speak to his rhema word to us personally. In other words, the Bible itself is written to us as a church, in, okay? But as, as, as the Bible is preached and spoken and, and studied, God gives us individual words, personal words, and usually it's at a time of dire need. And so we're going we're to look at some of those today. <clears throat> so you might, you might say that knowledge is hearing with your head ears and wisdom is hearing with your heart ears, okay? How does God provide truth? When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. That's John 16, 13. In other words, how does, how does God provide truth? He provides it through his Holy Spirit. Okay. <clears throat> now, I want to tell you guys <clears throat> something. Uh, Richard, John, and I, and Harry, we meet every Wednesday for lunch. And we do this to talk about things in the church. Now, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on, I promise you. Uh, <laughs> but our main, one of our main concerns is that the Holy Spirit be, be free. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be free to work in, 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 through the power of the Word as we teach. And we know that we can't provide, we can't reveal truth to you, but we can provide the Word and the Holy Spirit can reveal truth to you. Okay, so that's what we, we pray that every, every week for that. And the Holy Spirit will help us prepare and, and prepare the word that you need to hear and we need to hear. Sometimes we, we pray the, prepare the word and we need to hear it more than you do. And I, I do. That's how it happens with me. Okay? So anyway, we have seen several truths revealed in these two weeks in the study of Job. Richard shared last week a very important truth. <clears throat> the book of Job does not explain why suffering. It offers insight, truth, into how to think about God. So, here's the truth we need to understand as we're studying about Job. Don't focus on the suffering of Job. Focus on God's presence and provision during Job's suffering. You see that? Don't suffer, don't, if you start, the, I have Satan would like for us to focus on Job's distress and all that and focus on that, and then we wouldn't see the other little nuggets is in there. So what we need to focus on is God's presence and provision during the suffering of Job. And we're going to show, see some of those today. A good example. Job is a godly, blameless, and upright man. In separate but consecutive incidents, Job loses his animals, his servants, and his children. What does Job do? Well, it says Job's, Job goes into mourning but worships God. You notice that? He goes into mourning but he worships God. Acknowledging that everything that he has is from God and it is his prerogative to take it away. Now, Job, uh, Job could not do that had he not had a relationship with the Lord. In, in 122, Job does not sin 
And he does not blame God for what has happened. How can this be possible? There is only one possible. There is only possible because of God's grace in his heart. The only way Job could, could act this way, worship and not, uh, not blame God for all this is happening in his life is because God's grace is in his heart. Now, here's a rhema that God gave me. A revelation before God allowed the suffering, he provided the grace needed to endure the loss. Before God, before God allowed the suffering of Job, he provided the grace needed to endure the loss. That really spoke to me because I've been in a situation in the last the past few months where I really needed, I really needed God's grace. And he gave it to me. And I have a feeling that he provided it to me long ago and he, and he just brought it out as I needed it. Okay? It's not about Job. It describes a loving God. <clears throat> Next, Satan struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. That's in chapter 2. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. Can you, can you imagine that? Taking a piece of glass and scraping the sores off of you and the scabs off of you while you're sitting in the rubble of, of all that happened. That's the picture that we're really looking at. But see, that's not the picture. That's not the picture God wants us to see yet. Even when Job's wife tells him to curse God and get over with, Job does not sin with his lips. He said nothing against God. Again, how is Job able to endure? It's important to have knowledge of God's word so the Holy Spirit can reveal truth. Now, here's the truth that came to me as I was thinking about this. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. Again, God demonstrating his purpose through this man of integrity. God wants to prove that his power is great even through the weakness of a man like Job. What is God's intention to provide? Hey, here we, we study about this. What is God's intention to provide three friends for, from several places to come and see Job? Well, you know, here's the original plan. How did the Spirit guide them? Richard showed us this last week. They showed up. They came to mourn with him and to comfort him. And they slowed up. They sat down on the ground with him for seven days and nights. They sit and watched him scrape the sores off his body uh, in, a, in a heap of ashes. And then they hushed up. They could see how rotten he felt, how deeply he was suffering, so they did not say a word for seven days. Now, God may have provided these verses to teach us how to comfort someone that is suffering and how to do it in the spirit. Let me tell you, about four months ago, I was in this position. And let me tell you what, you'd be surprised at some of the things that people say to you when they come up and you're hurting. A lot of times they want to come up and tell you how they're hurting too or how they can relate to you because they hurt in the past. Matter of fact, I did tell one person, I said, I am very sorry you went through all that, but right now I need to focus on myself. <laughs> you know? I mean, I've heard that. But you know what? The main thing I saw was, was people came and sat at my side, put their arm around me, and some even said, there are no words. That, that showed me. I, I was blessed by that. I was relieved and comforted by that right there. We don't understand that, but God's word says, God's word says, Sometimes we just need to keep our mouth shut and not, not let them know how cool you are and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And I have, I, I'm talking to myself too. I've learned this myself, okay? Now, all, God also may be showing us how we in the flesh sometimes attempt to comfort someone that's suffering. After watching Job suffer for seven days, his friends see his despair. And here's what they heard Job say. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? In other words, he's saying, I wish I'd never even been born. These three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, decided that Job needs their counsel. You all remember? Yeah. <laughs> That's what sometimes people do. That's what sometimes people do when they come up to you and you see you sad and hurting and suffering because of a loss of a loved one or something. They think you may need their counsel. You know, you don't need their counsel. You just need their presence and their love. That's all you need. Okay. Anyway, these guys are going to 
do some counseling. These three men begin a series of speeches to Job. Some are very lengthy, a couple of chapters. And they take turns telling Job why he is having so many problems. And after each speech, Job replies or defends himself. Now these are recorded in chapters 4 through 32. 4 through 32. So you can see the majority of the book of Job is speeches by his friends and responses by Job. There's 42 verses all together, and 4 through 32 of them are, are what we're talking about here. Now, we're not going to go through all of these, but we went through some of them. Okay? Now, Job felt he was being tortured. He cried out wondering why he had to endure such horrible suffering. The three friends had one main point, which they repeated over and over again to Job. They insisted that he was suffering because he had sinned against God, and he was guilty, and it was his fault. Job, in his pain, attempted to explain to these guys that he had done nothing wrong and did not deserve all this. Remember that they did not know that it was actually Satan who had brought Job's suffering upon him, not because he had sinned, but because Satan wanted to try to get Job to turn his back on God. Also remember, God allowed Job to suffer to prove to Satan what kind of man he really was. What confidence God had in Job. Don't you wish God had confidence like that, in, like that in you? Say no. I wouldn't. I said, Job, I'd like you to have confidence in me, God, but please don't mention it to Satan. Yeah. <laughs> as you read through the accusations from these friends and the responses from Job as he is suffering in terrible pain, Job shows us glimpses of his faith. You can see that Job, Job continues to talk with God even though he feels like God is torturing him for no reason. All through all, through all this, you see God talking with, with, uh, with God, and he's sometimes talking, talking to him about things he, he, he remembers, and sometimes he's talking about things that he don't understand. Anyway, Job even states to these friends that he had rather communicate with God than with them. In other words, I trust God rather than man. Then Job tells his friends that God is in control and still on his throne. As Job is pleading with God for understanding in all his pain and suffering, even in his despair, he shows his true character. In, in chapter 13, verse 15, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Now, after 13 chapters here, he's, he's, he's still hurting. He's in great despair. He's being punished by his, his uh, he's being admonished by his friends. And he still says, I will Yet trust in him. I don't understand this, but I will trust in him. He still, he, still has, he still has some hope in there. About the same time, we, see, we think Job may be ready to give up. We see God's confidence in him. Last week, Richard shared from chapter 14. We saw as Job was being totally honest with God and questioned why he stayed the most important confession that man and woman can ever make. This is a paraphrase. Richard paraphrased this, and I'm going to show it to you. In verses, uh, chapter 14, verse 3 through 6, Job said, I admit I'm a sinner, but have mercy on me. Let me tell you what, folks. This is a personal statement. I made this statement honestly at about the age of 31, and my, my life changed dramatically. This is the first step, okay? And Job here was admitting this, and had mercy, but he, he knows he's not deserving this because it's, what did it say? He was an upright man. He had a walk with God and so forth. Okay. We also saw last week that even though Job was a man of faith, life was getting so tough that he seemed to be at the point of giving up hope. Richard's paraphrase here, in verse 7 through 12, many things will have a second chance at life, but not man. This was Job's thoughts at that time. And I'm climbing in the grave, but I sure hope this is not it. Here's where he was. He was climbing into the casket, and he was about to close the lid. And that's, where, that's what Richard was telling. Richard, Richard does not take uh, liberty with, with, with the scripture. He just adds to it a little bit here. <laughs> this is, which he paraphrases is what I'm saying, yeah. Which is cool because it's understanding. I understood. God spoke to me through that paraphrase. Moving on. 
chapter 15. This is Eliphaz's Eliphaz speech number two. He continues accusations against Job and accuses Job of not listening to the wisdom of these three men. In 15 through 16, Job responds by saying that he would rather his case be heard in heaven rather than in their foolishness. Job continues to talk about going to the grave and losing hope. So he's continuing talking about, I think I'm going to die. I'm in so much pain and God's not listening to me. He's not paying attention to me. And you guys are torturing me. I think I'm really going to die. Okay? Now, in, in Job 18, Bildad has his second speech. And Bildad tells Job, in effect, shut up and wise up. You need to listen to us. We're, we're telling you the truth. Here's what's, here's what's wrong with you. And he explains to Job that these things happen to those who are wicked and do not know God. Now, he doesn't come right out and say that you don't know God, but he's saying, you know, these things that are happening to you actually happen to wicked people that don't know God. He didn't actually say you don't know God, but he's really putting it down, putting it down, 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 pretty good. So, as we come to chapter 19, we find this is Job's sixth speech, which is a response to Bildad. Okay, we're going to read chapter 19. Now, this this is not this is not entirely in our text for today, but I want you to see we're going to sit up, we're going to sit it up. To, to have, see how Job actually feels and how he's, how he's almost ready to give up, okay? Then Job spoke again. How long will you torture me? How long will you try to crush me with your words? You have already insulted me ten times. You should be ashamed of treating me so badly. Even if I have sinned, that's my concern, not yours. You think you're better than I am, using my humiliation as evidence of my sin. But it is God who has wronged me, capturing me in his net. I cry out, help but no one answers me. I protest, but there is no justice. God has blocked my way, so I cannot move. He has plunged my path into darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He has demolished me on every side, and I am finished. He has uprooted my hope like a fallen tree. His fury burns against me. He counts me as an enemy. His troops advance. They build up roads and attack me. They camp all around my tent. My relatives stay far away. My friends have turned against me. My family is gone and my close friends have forgotten me. My servants and maids consider me a stranger. I'm like a foreigner to them. When I call my servant, he doesn't come. I have to plead with him. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I am rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I stand to speak, they turn their backs on me. My close friends detest me. Those I love have turned against me. I have been reduced to skin and bones and escaped death by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, my friends. Have mercy, for the hand of God has struck me. Must you also persecute me like God does? Haven't you chewed me up enough? Can you see the despair that Job's going through here? In verses 1 through 6, Job complains about the continuing words of his friends that torment him and break him. Even if I have sinned, that is no concern, that is my concern. He said, in other words, he's saying, my sin is none of your business. He says that if God sent them to say that, then God has wronged him too. And in verse 7 through 12, Job complains that his prayers go unheard and that God continues to break him down and attack him as an invading army. You know, this is how he feels. You know, sometimes we, our feelings tell us what not actual truth. Even though this is not the truth, this is how Job feels. And it's, and it's tearing him up inside. In 13 through 20, he has unsympathetic people in his life. His sadness is deepened by the fact that those close to him find him repulsive or withdraw from him. Physically, he is so unattractive, he looks like a living skeleton. His breath is foul and escaped death by the skin of his teeth. That must be where this comes from here. You know, I, I got by that by the skin of my teeth. You know, that must be where that comes from. Job feels like everyone has wronged him. In verse 21 through 20, he has unwarranted persecution. He pleads for pity from his friends 
whom he sees as persecuting him by their attitude and persistence. Job feels like everyone who I have loved have turned against me. I'm sure you will agree that Job is entering into some of the darkest times he's experienced. So far, this book, in this book, we have seen some flashes of faith in Job's despair. I'm sure you will, oh, I went the wrong way, excuse me. We know, we know that Job has a right relationship with God. In Job 1.1, 1, 1, remember that? There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and turned away from evil. God has a word for us in the next few verses. Before we go there, let me, let me tell you something. Job is, is, I want you to see that all up until right now, Job is, is being led into a, a false, a false uh, hope of, of insecurity. Uh, people t tell him how sorry he is and everything. He even thinks God's not answering him. But as you, if you went, went through this passage, you see God giving him little glimpses of hope with all through there. But what we're going to see now is uh, the quickest change in, 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 in activity in his mind you ever saw. Job says, woe is me, I'm going to die. I'm going to jump in the casket and die. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Instead of hearing from heaven, Job hears from his heart. <coughs> Follow along with me on chapter 19, 25 through 27. But as for me, I know my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Now you talk about a personal word from God. He, he says God's not talking to him. God's not answering his questions. And all of a sudden he turns, he turns from despair to the greatest hope that you could ever have. In, in one sentence here. What a statement of faith during a time of horrible suffering and uncertainty. Like a beam of light in all this darkness... Job declares what are perhaps the most famous words in the whole book. The key to Job's, Job's I, keep, I keep saying job, that's because John played that song. About get a job, get a job, yeah. The key to Job's survival during this horrific trial in life, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand on the earth at last. The root word in Hebrew and Greek both for the word know is similar to our understanding of knowing, but is more personal and intimate. Job knew the Redeemer. He knew the Lord. He had a personal relationship with God. He walked with the Lord, and he honored and served him daily. Job had lost much in his physical life, but he had not lost his relationship with God. And not only did Job know the Redeemer, the Redeemer knew him. Chapter 1, God calls him my servant Job. This book also prepares the way for the coming and resurrection of the return of Jesus Christ. And the, res and the resurrection of the believer's body. Now, this, this book, Job lived, what, about 4,000 years ago? Did we come up with something like that? About 4,000 years ago. He is, he, you're going to see that he quotes a lot of New Testament scripture in here. Let's see. Uh, and, and he says, and after my body was decayed, yet in my body will I see God. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the believer's resurrection. resurrection. I will see him for myself. Now, we're, we're talking about it's already been 4,000 years, and it's not happened yet, but it's going to. Job is in this place. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Yet, yes, I will see him with my own eyes. And here's, here, here's, the, here's the, the hope that came true. I am overwhelmed by the thought of all this. I'm overwhelmed. Can you see how he, he's now beginning to endure the suffering because of the, the mercy and, and, and the grace that God's put in his life? Remember what Job said in 14, 7 through 12. Many things will not have a second chance at life, but not man. Can you see that Job's 
that, that God's revealed truth changed his mind here? He said, I will see God. I will see God in my, in my second chance. Job longs for a mediator between him and God. You find that in chapter 9 and 33. And Jesus is our mediator, according to 1 Timothy 2.5. 2, and Job confessed his faith in a redeemer who would one day come. We saw that in, in chapter, uh, chapter, verse 25. Christ is that redeemer, we find in Ephesians 1.7. As you read this book, it seems as if, as if Job, God had put the wisdom of the New Testament in his heart. Look at, look at Romans if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And with the heart, one believes into righteousness, and with a mouth, confession is made into salvation. That is a New Testament pr principle about God, about Jesus. And who said that? Who said that 4,000 years ago? Job said that exact verse. He confessed, uh, he confessed Jesus as Lord, and he uh, and he believed and it brought him to righteousness. Well, this is the cornerstone upon our faith in Christ is built redemption, reconciliation, restoration, and resurrection. Those who are born again in Christ can declare with certainty, thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, now this this here is interesting right here. In Job 19, 23 through 24, look, look what he says. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they may be printed in a book. That they be graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. <clears throat> Isn't that ironic? Job says, I wish my words could be penned in a book. Did you know Job, Job's desire came true? You know how I know that? We are looking at his words today. Written thousands of years ago, and many other Christians have benefited from his experience, and they will continue. God's, Job's trust in God was a definitive knowing, and our faith in him can also be an authoritative knowing. For our trust stands on the unshakable facts within the word of God. And like Job, we too can say with authority that I know in whom I have believed, and I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, here's, here's something in the last couple of verses we're going to look at. Uh, it says, Job, Job tells these three guys, how dare you go on persecuting me, saying it's, it's, it's his own fault. You should fear punishment yourselves, for your attitude deserves punishment. Then you will know that there is indeed a judgment. In other words, he's telling them that pretty soon there's going to be a judgment for you guys. And we're, going to, we're not going to go into that right now because a few chapters later we're going to see what happens in, in this judgment. Okay? Job tells these three friends that their judgment's coming and we'll see what happens in the few, future. Now, I rushed through that real, real rapidly and I hope the Holy Spirit spoke to you like he did through me. And uh, I, I was trying to get to, to a point here where God could really speak to you even more. So you remember the story in the book of Ruth and the kinsman redeemer called Boaz. Remember that story? Ruth's husband died and she lived in poverty with her mother, Naomi. The bottom line, one day Ruth was living off the scrap grain in the field. The next day she married Boaz and became the owner of the field. <laughs> Boaz became her kinsman redeemer. A great Old Testament Redeemer story. Now, by the way, when Ruth and Boaz married, they had a child. And they kept having kids, and their, and their, and their lineage went up to the, well, who? King David. And then who else came out of the lineage of that? Jesus Christ himself, who is what? Our Redeemer. Okay, so that's a good story. Now, let's look at a modern day story. Rick told his father that he always wanted to participate in a triathlon. We call it the Ironman race. But Rick had one problem. His body was broken. So his father, in grace and mercy, stepped in to help. Let's see what happened. <coughs> oh, thank you. Who told the sun where it's standing? You can only come this far 
this thing about 15 times in the last two weeks and I cannot keep from crying every time I see it. Now on the back, on the back page, in case some of y'all have not seen this before, here's the story on the back page. And it's called Team Hoyt. Let me just bring it to your attention. We'll start with the second paragraph here. When Rick Hoyt was born in 1962, he made a very difficult time coming into this world when the umbilical cord was wrapped tightly around his neck. The lack of oxygen during his birth would ultimately leave Rick a quadriplegic, suffering cerebral palsy. People told his parents they, would, they should institutionalize Rick because he was hopeless and would never be more than a vegetable. 
Well, thank God Rick's parents knew better. They could tell that he followed them with his eyes and knew that just because he couldn't talk didn't mean he couldn't understand. Eventually, a costly computer system was used for Rick to be able to communicate with his parents, and they realized he loved sports. In 1977, he asked his dad to help so he could run in a race to benefit a lacrosse player at his school who had become paralyzed. He thought it would inspire the boy to see life and go on in spite of his disability. What ended up being, happening during the race would change Rick, Dick and Rick's lives together. After, here's what, here's, after the race, Rick said, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not handicapped. <laughs> Did you, he actually believed he was running. This, this moved his dad so much when they eventually, they eventually go on to run in 1,100 races, including 72 marathons. This was quite a accomplishment because Dick had never been a runner, and he was already 36 years old. Anyway, they, they talked about the Boston Marathon being their very last one, and the bombing stopped all that, so the next year they went back and finished the Boston Mar Marathon. You talk about hope. You talk about, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is a great answer. So how many of you say, I know that I know that I know my Redeemer lives? Absolutely, absolutely. Let me close in prayer.